You are listening to the Adult Sabbath School Lessons for the third quarter of 2022. This is lesson number 13 of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, In the Crucible with Christ. The lesson today is titled Christ in the Crucible and is ready for teaching on September 24. The author is Pastor Gavin Anthony, who was conference president in Iceland when he wrote this series of lessons. Today, your lesson is read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, September 17. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that the crucible that cost the most was the crucible of the cross. And this week, as we look at how that relates to us and how we have the opportunity of putting our hand in the hand of the lovely Jesus who gave his life so that we could have salvation and that we could live a life that is positive and ennobling. We pray, Lord, that you'll bless and guide us. And today I'd like to think of those and pray for those in Belize and Antigua and in Barbados in the Caribbean and Port Elizabeth and Johannesburg in South Africa, Kuwait Sao Pablo in the Philippines, Warunga in Australia, Kaitaia in New Zealand, Newcastle in the United Kingdom, and Sao Paulo in Brazil. And wherever people are listening to this podcast, Lord, of your lesson, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be there, not just to comfort, but to guide. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's read that again, Matthew 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Whenever we look at the issue of suffering, the question comes, how did sin and suffering first arise? Through divine revelation, we have good answers. They arose because free beings abused the freedom God had given them. This leads to another question. Did God know beforehand that these beings would fall? Yes, but obviously he thought it was, as C.S. Lewis wrote, worth the risk. Worth the risk? For whom? For us, while God sits in heaven on his throne? Not exactly. The freedom of all his intelligent creatures was so sacred that rather than deny us freedom, God chose to bear in himself the brunt of the suffering caused by our abuse of that freedom. And we see this suffering in the life and death of Jesus, who, through suffering in our flesh, has created bonds between heaven and earth that will last throughout eternity. And now for the week at a glance. Two questions we'll answer this week. What did Christ suffer in our behalf? What can we learn from his suffering? Sunday, September 18, the early days. Scripture gives us little information about the early years of Jesus. A few verses, however, tell us something about the conditions he lived under and the kind of world the Saviour entered. Read Luke chapter 2, verse 7 and 22 to 24, and Leviticus 12, verses 6 to 8, and Matthew 2, verses 1 to 18. What do we see in these texts that gives us an indication of the kind of life Jesus faced from the start? First of all, Luke chapter 2 verse 7, And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. 
And then at verse 22, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves and two young pigeons. And we compare that with Leviticus 12, verses 6 to 8. When the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. He shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her, and then she will be ceremonially clean from her flow of blood. These are the regulations for the woman who gives birth to a boy or a girl. But if she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her and she will be clean. And Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it arose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen, when it arose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And, having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realised that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. Of course, Jesus was not the first person to live in poverty or to face those who wanted to kill him, even from an early age. There is, however, another element that helps us understand the uniqueness of what Christ suffered from the earliest times. Read John 1 verse 46. What element does this add to help us understand what sufferings the young Jesus had faced? John 1, 46, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. With the exceptions of Adam and Eve before the fall, Jesus was the only sinless person who ever lived on the earth. In his purity, in his sinlessness, he was immersed in a world of sin. 
what torture it must have been, even as a child, for his pure soul constantly to be in contact with sin. Even in our hardness because of sin, we ourselves often shrink away from exposure to sins and evils that we find repulsive. Imagine what it must have been like for Christ, whose soul was pure, who wasn't the least bit tainted by sin. Think of the sharp contrast between himself and others around him in that regard. It must have been exceedingly painful for him. And so, to finish today, ask yourself, how sensitive am I to the sins that exist all around us? Do they bother me or am I hardened to them? If you are hardened to them, could it be because of the things you read, watch or even do? Think about it. Monday, September 19. Despised and rejected of men. Read the following texts, all the while keeping in mind the fact that Jesus was divine, the creator of heaven and earth, and that he came to offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Matthew 12, 22 to 24. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw, and all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Baalzebub, the ruler of the demons. And Luke four twenty one to 30 And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marvelled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath, in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then, passing through the midst of them, he went his way. And John eight fifty eight and 59, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. How do these texts help us understand the sufferings that Jesus faced here on earth? Whether by leaders or even by the common people, Jesus' life, acts and teaching were constantly misunderstood, leading to rejection and hatred from people who he came to serve. In a certain sense, it must be like a parent who sees a wayward child in need of help, and though the parent is willing to give everything for that child, the child spurns the parent, heaping scorn and rejection upon perhaps the only person who can spare that child from utter ruin. That's what Jesus faced while here on earth. How painful it must have been for him. Read Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. What does it tell us about how Christ felt about the rejection? As you read, ask yourself too, was he feeling bad for himself, as we often do when facing rejection, or was it for another reason? If for another reason, what was it? 
Matthew 23, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. We've all felt the sting of rejection, and maybe our pain was similar to Christ's in that it was unselfish. We were pained not because we were rejected, but because of what the rejection would mean for the one who was rejecting us, perhaps someone we care about who refuses to accept salvation in Christ. Imagine, though, how it must have felt to Jesus, who was fully aware of what he was to face in order to save them, and at the same time fully aware of what the consequences of their rejection would be. Ellen White writes in Selected Messages, Book 3, page 129, It was because of his innocence that he, that is Christ, felt so keenly the assaults of Satan. And so to finish the day, what can you learn from Christ that can help you better cope with the pain of rejection? What does his example show you? How can you apply it to your own life? Tuesday, September 20, Jesus in Gethsemane. Mark 14, verse 34 reads, And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch. Whatever Jesus suffered throughout his 33 years here on earth, nothing compared to what he began to face in the last hours before the cross. From the eternal ages, the sacrifice of Jesus as the offering for the world's sin was planned, and now it was all coming to pass. As you read in Ephesians 1, verses 1 to 4, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus, and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And Second Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And Titus 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. What do the following texts tell us about Christ's suffering in Gethsemane? Matthew 26, verse 39. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And Mark 14, verses 33 to 36. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And Luke 22, verses 41 to 44 
And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 686, He went a little distance from them, not so far but that they could both see and hear him and fell prostrate upon the ground. He felt that by sin he was being separated from his father. The gulf was so broad, so black, so deep, that his spirit shuddered before it. This agony he must not exert his divine power to escape. As man, he must suffer the consequences of man's sin. As man, he must endure the wrath of God against transgression. Christ was now standing in a different attitude from that in which he had ever stood before. His suffering can best be described in the words of the prophet, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 13.7. As the substitute and surety for sinful man, Christ was suffering under divine justice. He saw what justice meant. Hitherto he had been as an intercessor for others. Now he longed to have an intercessor for himself. End of quote. And so to finish today, dwell upon what was happening to Jesus in Gethsemane. Already the sins of the world were starting to fall upon him. Try to imagine what that must have been like. No human being has ever been called to go through anything like this before or since. What does this tell us about God's love for us? What hope can you draw from this for yourself? Wednesday, September 21, The Crucified God Death by crucifixion was one of the harshest punishments the Romans meted out to anyone. It was considered the worst way to die. Thus, how horrific for anyone to be killed that way, in particular the Son of God. Jesus, we must always remember, came in human flesh like ours. Between the beatings, the scourgings, the nails hammered into his hands and feet, and the harrowing weight of his own body tearing at the wounds, the physical pain must have been unbearable. This was harsh, even for the worst of criminals. How unfair, then, that Jesus, innocent of everything, should face such a fate. Yet, as we know, Christ's physical sufferings were mild in contrast to what really was happening. This was more than just the killing of an innocent man. What events surrounding the death of Jesus showed that more was going on than most people there understood at the time? What significance can we find in each of these events that can help reveal what happened there? Matthew 27, 45 Now, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. Matthew 27, verses 51 to 52. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And Mark 15 and verse 38, Then the veil of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. Clearly, something much more was happening here than just the death, however unfair, of an innocent man. According to Scripture, God's wrath against sin, our sin, was poured out upon Jesus. Jesus on the cross suffered a righteous, God's righteous indignation against sin the sins of the whole world. As such, Jesus suffered something deeper, darker, and more painful than any human being could ever know 
or experience. And so to finish the day, as you go through whatever struggles you are facing, what hope and comfort can you draw from the reality of Christ suffering for you on the cross? Thursday, September 22, The Suffering God We might as well get used to it. As long as we are here, in this world, we are going to suffer. As fallen creatures, it is our fate. Nothing in the Bible promises us anything different. On the contrary, what do the following texts have to tell us about the topic at hand? Acts 14, 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, you must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. And Philippians 1, verse 29, for to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Yet, in the midst of our suffering, we should keep two things in mind. First, Christ our Lord has suffered more than any of us ever could. At the cross, he, as it says in Isaiah 53.4 has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. What we now know only as individuals, he suffered for us all corporately. He who was sinless became sin for us, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, suffering in a way that we as sinful creatures couldn't begin to imagine. But second, as we suffer, we should remember the results of Christ's suffering. That is, what we have been promised through what Christ has done for us. Read John 10.28, Romans 6.23, Titus 1.2, and 1 John chapter 2 and verse 25. What are we promised? John 10.28 And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Titus 1.2 In hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 25. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. Whatever our sufferings here, thanks to Jesus, thanks to his bearing in himself the punishment of our sin, thanks to the great provision of the gospel, that through faith we can stand perfect in Jesus right now, we have the promise of eternal life. We have the promise that because of what Christ has done, because of the fullness and completeness of his perfect life and perfect sacrifice, our existence here, full of pain, disappointment and loss, is no more than an instant, a flash, here and gone, in contrast to the eternity that awaits us, an eternity in a new heaven and a new earth, one without sin, suffering and death. And all this is promised to us and made certain for us only because of Christ and the crucible he went into so that one day, coming soon, he will see, as it says in Isaiah 53 verse 11, the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Friday, September 23. Three times has he uttered that prayer. Three times has humanity shrunk from the last crowning sacrifice. But now the history of the human race comes up before the world's Redeemer. 
He sees that the transgressors of the law, if left to themselves, must perish. He sees the helplessness of man. He sees the power of sin, the woe and lamentations of a doomed world rise before him. He beholds its impending fate, and his decision is made. He will save man at any cost to himself. He accepts his baptism of blood, that through him perishing millions may gain everlasting life. He has left the courts of heaven, where all is purity, happiness and glory, to save the one lost sheep, the one world that has fallen by transgression. And he will not turn from his mission. He will become the propitiation of a race that has willed to sin. His prayer now breathes only submission. If this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And that passage was from The Desire of Ages, page 690 and 693. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. How does it help us in our own sufferings, this knowledge that God himself, in the person of Christ, suffered more than any of us ever could? What should the sufferings of Christ in our behalf mean to us? What comfort can we draw from this amazing truth? As you think about your answer, keep in mind the following statement from Ellen White in Selected Messages, Book 3, page 129. All the suffering, which is the result of sin, was poured into the bosom of the sinless Son of God. Two, as a class, go over the sufferings of Christ, examined in this week's lesson. What were the crucibles that Christ faced? In what ways are they like our own? And in what ways are they different? What can we learn from how he handled these challenges that can help us amid our own crucibles? 3. What are some of your favourite Bible promises, promises that you can cling to amid sorrow and pain? Write them out, claim them for yourself, and share them in class. And finally, write out a summary paragraph highlighting whatever main points you got from this quarter's lessons. What questions were resolved for you? What issues still remain unanswered? How can we help each other work through those things that still greatly perplex and trouble us? Inside Story. Our mission story continues this week with episode number 13 of this amazing story that tells of God's power, grace and love. Preparing to See Jesus, Part 13 by Andrew McChesney. The evil spirits have fallen silent. Father believes Christ won a victory over Satan with the baptism and that is why the devil tried so hard to prevent it. Peace has filled the family home. Mother is a church deaconess and she still sings in the choir, while Junior is 17 and finishing high school. Father, who is 43, has shared his incredible story in churches around Brazil, and many of those who have heard it have committed their lives to Jesus. In Kawari, where Father decided to follow Jesus, 16 people gave their hearts to Christ after hearing his testimony. Father credits the Holy Spirit, not his story, for changing hearts. My experience is shocking, but I see the Holy Spirit working in their hearts as they listen, he said. In addition to sharing his story, Father sells Bibles and has presented them to his mother, his older sister and his two younger brothers. He is praying for them. His mother stopped worshipping in the Candoble Temple long before his baptism. When she learned that evil spirits were trying to kill him, she resolved to have nothing more to do with them. While Father is rejoicing in his new life in Christ, he remains watchful by praying and reading the Bible every day. He remembers 1 Peter 5 verse 8, which says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He also is mindful of the warning in Matthew 12:43 to 45 where Jesus said, 
When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. And then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. But Father is not afraid. Even now the devil has no power over me, he said. That's why I preach in every church that I visit. He dreams of the day when he will meet Jesus face to face. I pray that the Lord will never give up on me. I also pray not to give him up, he said. I pray that I remain faithful and persevere until the end. I have hope that I will see him. That is my hope. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.